Welcome to our service this morning. It's nice to be with you once again uh, as we gather together to sing praises and worship to our Lord Jesus Christ, as we remember who he is and what he's done for us through his sacrifice on the cross. Uh, just by way of reminder, there is um, a library. If you're not aware of it, there's a library out in the vestry in the room off to my right here. Uh, and if you want to borrow books from that, there are some good books there. Please see Jackie and, and we'll be able to make that available to you. There are some good books. They do need to be read and you need to read them. So get, borrow them, use them. They will help you. They will encourage you. Uh, so please make use of that library. Um, I don't think there are any other announcements uh, from anyone. I don't think the elders have anything that we wanted to bring to your attention. Um, we had a session meeting this week, which was, uh, was that this week? Was that last? I'm losing track of the time. I think it was last week, yes. And that was very good. We do have presbytery this week. That's noted in the um, bulletin. So please be praying for us and for presbytery as we meet on Tuesday. Um, so yes, please be in prayer for that. And also notice that all our fellowships are starting up again uh, this week. So on the 14th, on Tuesday, we also are meeting for our Tuesday fellowship at 11 a.m. here. Uh, and it's a bring your own lunch. So if you want to join us, if you haven't been before, please come. Uh, it's a wonderful time of fellowship and, and learning as we gather around God's word and we... Uh, we, our minds are expanded and we join in song. If, please come. Please join us. Um, and also next Sunday we'll be starting up our uh, Bible study at 6pm uh, here in the vestry. So please put that one in your diaries as well. We'd love to see you there for that as well. That's everything by way of announcements. Uh, we're going to open and I'm going to read from Psalm 111. I'm going to read the whole of the psalm. I thought it was very helpful. So it's Psalm 111. And this is what it says. As we prepare our hearts and minds to give praise and thanks to our God. It says this. Praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart in the company of the upright in the congregation. Great are the works of the Lord, studied by all who delight in them. Full of splendor and majesty is his work, and his righteousness endures forever. He has caused his wondrous works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and merciful. He provides food for those who fear him. He remembers his covenant forever. He has shown his people the power of his works in giving them the inheritance of the nations. The works of his hands are faithful and just. All his precepts are trustworthy. They are established forever and ever to be performed with faithfulness and uprightness. He sent redemption to his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All those who practice it have a good understanding. His praise endures forever. Well, isn't it right and proper then to praise and glorify our God? Well, we're going to do that now as we sing from Rejoice number 70, nay, uh, Praise My Soul, the King of Heaven. Rejoice number 70, Praise My Soul, the King of Heaven. Oh, I 
Well, Lord our God, as we come before you today, we acknowledge you as mighty God, the one whose works are clearly on display in all that we see. Who can look at this world that you have created and not know that you are the one who is over it all? Oh Lord our God, we thank you that you have called into being all that exists and that you have done so through your mighty word and through the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh Heavenly Father, as we come near to you this day, may your praise be on our lips for this great gift that you have given us of life. And yet, Father, you have done so much more. For we are a, a people who have gone astray. Now We wander off into our own paths constantly. And yet you, in your mercy and your grace, have called us back into your loving care. And you have shown us how much you love us by sending your son Jesus to suffer and die for all our sin, all our rebellion, all our wickedness. He took it all upon the cross and we thank you for him. But you have also given us faith to trust in him, knowing that there is no other path to forgiveness except through him. And so we thank you more for all your goodness toward us in Christ. O oh Lord, may our lives be lived as though we know and love Jesus. Let our lives be lived in obedience to his good commands. May we follow his example closely. May we listen to the teaching of your word, which guides us and instructs us as to how you would have us live holy lives. O oh Lord, our God, we do have heavy hearts because of our sin this week. We know we have failed you. We know we have let others down by our sinful attitudes and thoughts. O oh Lord our God, forgive us. Not that we deserve it, not that we can make up for it with any good deeds of our own, but we trust wholly in Jesus Christ that his death has paid for it all. And we thank you for him. And so fill us, Father, with your spirit. Help us to walk in good and righteous ways that would show that we are your people, that would show that we are following Christ. And be with us even this day as we encourage each other to love you with greater strength and to serve others with diligence. O oh Lord our God, we ask that we would do these things. In the name of your Son, our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, I'm going to hand it over to uh, Alan, who's going to lead us in our memory verse uh, for the month. Thanks, Alan. Can I explain uh, two things about the memory verse? Uh, we pick these verses because we think that they are very good to have in our minds. And some of you have spoken uh, to us about the fact that at particular experiences you've been through, sometimes it's these verses that have meant uh, so much for you and been such a help. Secondly, they give us a chance to explain further certain teaching of uh, the Bible. And uh, I'm going to try and do that today, uh, especially in reference to what John's Gospel here says about signs and wonders that Jesus did. Let us say together then, uh, John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you might have life in his name. John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31. Like many other parts of the New Testament, you can't explain them without looking back to the Old Testament. There was a famous bishop in uh, the 4th century AD, uh, Augustine of Hippo in North Africa, and he had a little phrase uh, that we've borrowed into English. He said it in rhyming Latin, but we've got it in English. Uh, 
comparing the Old and New Testaments, what he said was, the new is in the old concealed, the old is in the new revealed. Now, that's very, very good. Let me repeat it. The new is in the old concealed, the old is in the new revealed. All right, we come here to this word signs. You only have to look back to the Old Testament, to the time of Exodus, and you'll find that there are many references to signs and wonders. Remember when Moses was trying to persuade Pharaoh to let the children of Israel go out of Egypt? He did signs, or God did signs and wonders. In Hebrew, the word for wonder is only used of things that God, God alone can do. That is, uh, we, have, we use the word wonderful or wondrous in a very debased way. You can, tell me of, uh, you can tell me of a wonderful birthday weekend you had, and I'll say, oh, how wonderful. But other people have birthdays too, and it can be wonderful. But when the Old Testament uses the word wonderful, It's dealing with something that no man could do, only God could do it. And those were the signs and wonders, the plagues in Egypt that we have there. They were intended to so press upon Pharaoh that he'd say, oh yes, you people can go, you can can leave. So the signs were intended to impel someone to action. Now, isn't it striking that we not only have them with the Exodus, but we have them in the Gospels as well. Jesus did many signs. And why were they given? They were given in order to impel people to believe in him. To say to them, look at this one who did that. Is he not Jesus, the Son of God? Should we not believe in him that we may have have life? Don't just think of the miracles in the Gospels as showing us that God was kind or that God was good because the signs also served another purpose. They were signposts. They directed attention to things that Jesus was going to do and especially to the fact that he was going to die upon the cross and he was going to be the one who would conquer all the forces of darkness He'd conquer all that uh, came against us and compelled us to, in our sinfulness. Uh, They were signposts uh, to the death of the Lord Jesus. So when we read the Gospels and we read that Jesus healed a man or he even raised a man from the dead, don't just think that that was showing God was so good and kind. But they are pointing to the fact that here was the Saviour who would come to give himself He was the one who was going to conquer all the powers of darkness, as Paul speaks of in Colossians. And what was the purpose of them? Two things. They were to show us that Jesus was indeed the Messiah, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life in his name. Like many things in the Bible, the miracles that we have recorded in the Gospel are not there just to satisfy our curiosity. They're not there to show to us, oh, yes, this was the sort of thing that Jesus did. No, they are there to display the power of God displayed in his own son, the Lord Jesus, and they are intended to bring us to believe in the Lord Jesus and have life through his name. So that, that's what the purpose of these signs were, and this is what this verse from John 20 reminds us of. It is, as it were, it re-echoes what is said in the opening chapter of John that uh, Brett is spe- spe- or started to speak on last week in his sermon and continues today. They come at the very end and echo the same story. So let us say again uh, this verse, uh, John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you might have life 
in his name. Verses 30 and 31. Uh, thanks, Alan. And in response to that, we're going to sing uh, Rejoice 151, Name of All Majesty, the name that only belongs to Jesus. to pray for us as we pray for the needs of our church and the world around us. Uh, there are some prayer points there in your bulletins. Um, please do note those. Uh, take them home and pray them yourselves with your families uh, in your own prayer time. Uh, and uh, do be especially praying for the continued work that God will be doing and is doing through this congregation and that we would be keen to see others come to Christ through us as he draws them in. Uh, but let us. Uh, there's also some prayer points there for uh, Calvin and Ruth Mathis, and also Eva and Laszlo Mahali, uh, both missionaries that we have supported in the past. So keep your uh, prayers for them going as well. And just a quick update on uh, Kate and Matt Vinicombe. Um Kate has been moved to the Spinal Care Hospital in Melbourne, uh, where she's continuing to undergo treatment. So please keep praying for them as well. Let's pray. O Lord our God, as we come before you once more this day, we acknowledge you as a God who knows our every need before we even ask it. We acknowledge you as the God who can do above what we ask or think or even imagine. And for they are your words to us. And we thank you that this is the case. O Lord our God, we are so grateful to the way that you have provided uh, for our spiritual need in this place. 
that way you have continued to sustain us and uphold us and build us and encourage us through your word, through the meeting together of each other and through our week as we have conversations with one another. How good it is, Father, to dwell amongst your believers. How good it is to be together where we can get a taste of what the heavenly glory will be like when we are all gathered before the throne of your grace singing praises to your name. O oh Lord our God, we do pray for those who are struggling with illness, those who are unwell. We ask God that you would bring your blessing upon them, that you would by your grace heal them if that is your will. But we also pray, Father, that they will remain steadfast and strong in the faith, that they will see this as a time where they are built up and encouraged to keep trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ and cast all their care upon you. And may they even bear witness to the Lord Jesus Christ, even in their ill state. Heavenly Father, we pray for others who can't be with us, who have been in the past, and yet uh, perhaps because of age or illness, they cannot be here with us any longer. We ask that we would be mindful of them, that we would be those who love and care for them and reach out to them and let them know that they are remembered and they are loved. Oh Lord our God, may this be a task that you lay on each of us, that we would be there to care for one another, as you teach us in your word we should. We pray, Father, for uh, those who are grieving the loss of loved ones, and we know that there are many. Oh Lord our God, would you have wrap your arms of care and support around them, and once more that if we can be of any assistance to the grieving process, use us as you will. Help us to bear witness to Jesus in all that we say and do for one another. We do pray, Father, that you would continue to be with those uh, churches in the Presbyterian Church around the state who are currently vacant. And I do particularly remember Wangaratta. And uh, I pray that you would... Continue to bless that congregation. Help it to grow and change. Help them to make good and wise decisions as they look to the future. And provide for them a pastor who will lead them and guide them. We also pray, Father, for the raising up of elders in our churches throughout the state of Victoria. Men who know and love, the, love your word. Who are competent in it to be able to teach. Who show good character and are growing in holiness and sanctification. Oh Lord our God, raise them up, even amongst this congregation, but amongst others as well, that there might be a strong band of elders in our churches to help lead and guide your church. Oh Lord our God, we pray that you will continue to bless uh, our congregation. Help us to go out and equip and train others to share the word of God, even as we share the word of God with others. That people might come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That this church would be established as a place where Jesus is known and proclaimed and where your glory shines. Oh, may we be that people. May we be such a people that through us, people will see Jesus Christ himself and come to know him and trust him and live for him. Our oh, Heavenly Father, we do pray that you will continue to uh, watch over and care for each of your churches in the world. We pray for those overseas who are doing it hard, for our brothers and sisters who are persecuted, particularly those in India, but we also think of those in China and parts of the Middle East uh, where there is persecution, Myanmar, so many places around the world where your people cannot meet safely. Oh Lord our God, would you be with them? Would you keep them steadfast in their faith? Would you work in the hearts of their persecutors to even turn them to Jesus Christ, that they might see the foolishness of what they are doing? Oh Lord our God, we pray not only for these, but for those who are going into different places around the world to share your word. We do think of particularly Calvin and Ruth Mathis and Eva and Laszlo Mahali. And we ask that you will continue to be with each of these as they 
uh, continue to share your word in the work that they are doing. We pray that it would go out far and wide and that there would be many coming to faith because of the work that they are doing. We ask God that you would give them rest when they need it, but that you would keep them diligent in serving you as they serve the places where you have sent them and the people you have sent them to. Lord our God, we ask all these things in the name of our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Uh, Let's sing again. This time I'm going to sing number 592 in Rejoice. Who can cheer the heart like Jesus? we do thank you and praise you that you are a God of greatness, of grace and of goodness. And in your grace you have seen fit to supply our every need. And you supply the need of this congregation so generously. And we thank you for it. We ask, Father, that you will continue to use these gifts to expand the work of your kingdom here in this place. But more than that, Father, use our very lives to bring honour to Christ to uh, speak of Christ and to live for Christ in all that we say and all that we do. For we owe our very lives to you, our great God and Saviour. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you would please open your Bibles to uh, our New Testament reading. 
which is John chapter 1. And I'm going to be reading from verse 1 through to verse 18. And now if you have your pew Bibles there, that's found on page 1053 of the pew Bibles. So it's John chapter 1, and I'm reading from verse 1 through to verse 18. This is what our God says to us. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light, that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me, because he was before me. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. Well, keep your Bibles open there at John 1. Uh, we're going to be exploring verses 6 to 18. Now, the rest of the prologue that I didn't get to last week uh, as we give our attention to God's word. But I'm going to pray for us before we do that. Will you pray with me? Lord our God, as we come to your word this day, Open our hearts and our minds to receive it and send your spirit to be among us, to guide us to all truth, that we might know you as you are and what you have done for us through Christ, that we might live in that way, according to the light that you shed upon us. We ask it in Jesus. Amen. Who's the greatest? That's a good way to start a lively debate, isn't it? Who's the greatest footballer? Who's the greatest author? Who's the greatest actor that's ever been? Who's the greatest painter, musician, composer, poet, singer, cricketer? I could go on. You could get a really lively debate going, couldn't you? An endless list of discussions that could be had about who's the greatest in any field of endeavour. You could have a similar discussion about different cultures. We could talk about which families have most impacted the world and think about the pros and cons of these families. Think about the British royal family. When we get down to the really important issue of life, though, how we should live, who we should listen to, the Bible gives us just one answer. Jesus. The Christ. The Son of God, he is who we should be listening to. He is the one we should be placing our trust in because he is the only one who offers us life now and life forever. And that's what I think John is doing here. is showing us that every other facet of life is pointless without Jesus. Jesus ought to be our focus he ought to be the person upon whom we centre our lives because he offers us life. Every other concern of this world and every other voice needs to fade away so that Jesus becomes the only one 
we listen to and follow. He is the Christ. He is the Son of God. That's what John's saying to us. That's the point he's making. Let me state it plainly so we're very clear. Eternal life comes only when we put our faith in Jesus, which we can only do when God, by his grace and by his choice, makes us his children. And therefore, we should pay attention to and follow Jesus. Well, I hear someone saying, well, I know this. This is clear to anyone who's been a Christian for any amount of time. That's obviously this is true. Well, that's great. Are you putting it into practice? As John wrote this biography of Jesus, there were people around in his day who were focusing all their attention on other people. Like, for example, John the Baptist. And he's one figure that John mentions in this prologue, apart from Jesus. And believe it or not, there are still groups today, mostly situated in Iraq, who still focus their attention on John the Baptist. Even in Jesus' estimation, John was a good man. Uh, if you look at Matthew 11 and, and Luke 7, Jesus says, he says it so plainly, among those born of women, there is none greater than John the Baptist. John the Baptist was good. Why was he so good? Well, John tells us he was sent by God. He was sent by God. He's an amazing man. He's a blessed man. Uh, according to what Luke tells us, when Gabriel announced to John's father, Zechariah, that, that this man was to be born of Elizabeth, Gabriel said to Zechariah that his son would be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. What a remarkable man. What a remarkable blessing. John, sent by God to prophesy for God, to be a fulfillment of God's prophecy, as we'll find out later in John 1 verse 23. But the most important work that John the Baptist is going to do is to be a witness to Jesus. The most important work that John the Baptist will do will be to point people to Jesus Christ. And that's what John the Baptist did. Have a look down at verse 15. John bore witness about Jesus, the word that had become flesh. This was he of whom I said, says John the Baptist, he who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. John's whole message was don't look at me Look to him. Look to Jesus, who is the Christ, the Son of God. That was John the Baptist's message. That's what his job. He's, he didn't come to make himself known or to talk about himself. He came to prepare the way for Jesus, who was to come. To tell us who Jesus was. Not just a good man. Not just a moral man, but the one who was with God before all things were made, the one who has preeminence in all of the universe. Before me, says John, he was there. And John bore witness to Jesus for one simple reason. Verse 7, that all might believe through him. The whole purpose of John the Baptist's mission in pointing people to Jesus was so that they would believe in Jesus. That he was the son of God, sent from God, that he is the one to take away the sin of the world. We also see what John, our author, says about John the Baptist, that he was not the light. Uh, John, our author, is very clear about that. John the Baptist was not the light coming into the world. He was not the Christ. He was not the word made flesh. And we see more of John declaring that later in chapter 1. He doesn't want us to be in any confusion. John the Baptist was a man unlike any other in all the generations of God's people. But he was not the Christ. He was still a man. And his job was to point us to Christ. Why? Because John the Baptist cannot save anyone. John the Baptist cannot save us. And that leads us to a broader principle. No other man but Christ can save us. 
Jesus is the only one who can offer us reconciliation with God, new life with God, eternal life with God. Now, I know I might be stating something that's obvious to many of us, something that many of us already know. But I ask again, do you live your life as though you know this to be true? I've seen good people who have known Jesus Christ and who have been wonderful Christian people wax eloquently about Queen Elizabeth II and how wonderful she was and what a great example she was to the point that they talked more about Queen Elizabeth than they talked about Jesus Christ. I've heard good people in Christian churches decry that unless you vote a certain way, you cannot be a Christian. I've heard that. I've seen that. I've been on the receiving end of it. I've heard others in churches say, well, I measure everything I hear by. And then they give the name of their favorite preacher or pastor. Don't measure what you hear by your favourite preacher and pastor. In fact, I don't even want you to listen to me, except if what I am saying points you to the word of God, which points you to Jesus Christ. Don't measure what you hear by your favourite political party, your favourite preacher, your favourite person in the media. Measure everything by who Jesus Christ is. Measure everything by the word of God. Listen to what Jesus says. Make him your teacher. Make him your master. Make him your Lord. Follow him. Don't put your hope in any other man. No other man can save you. No other man can save you. No other person can save you. Don't be misled by others. Follow Jesus. Only he can bring life, forgiveness and reconciliation. And when you come to Christ, well, you're going to need to trust him. We shouldn't, be, we shouldn't blindly follow what even the best of humanity has to say to us. Because the best human on earth is still a human at best. I have a look at verses 9 and 10 of uh, John 1. John says, The true light which gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. Now, most of the time when John speaks of the world in the gospel, it's with the understanding that the world is a broken place, living in rebellion against its creator. That's how John speaks of the world most of the time. There's a few occasions where the world is a neutral, uh, a neutral sort of place. You know, it's just there. It's an object. You know, all the books in the world could not contain everything that Jesus said and did. And that's what we're told in verse 10. The world was made through Jesus, but the world did not know him. It is a world that has rebelled against its creator. That's the human condition. We are, each of us, broken and battered because of sin, Reckless disobedience against God, and that's inherent in each of us. It's our nature. Jesus was coming into that mess. As a a kid, uh, my brother and I, when we were younger, hounded our parents. And I'm I'm not using that as a pun. We hounded our parents to get a dog. Now, eventually, one school holidays, they, they, they gave in and we got a dog. And we played with this dog and we walked the dog and we fed the dog and we were always with the dog. But then the school holidays ended. And what happens when the school holidays end? Well, the kids go to school, mum and dad are back at work and we get home from school and we're fighting about whose turn it is to feed the dog and we're reluctant to go and take the dog for walks. And of course, the dog gets very bored at home without people to play with. And so he finds a new pastime, a new way to entertain himself. Digging up the garden becomes his new favourite pastime. Well, after a few weeks of this, you can imagine mum and dad are not too pleased with the new dog. And they do what good parents do, and they decide that he needs a new home. (laughs) 
Well, that's one way to deal with a troublesome creature, isn't it? Get rid of it. That's one way God could have dealt with the world who had turned its back on him. But he didn't. Instead, he did what was needed. He sent his son, the true light, into the mess to bring some of its people back to himself. God didn't give up on people. He sent his son to bring a solution. Well, what happened though? Well, Jesus came into his own world. It was his creation. And even to the people God had chosen, but they did not receive him. That's what John says to us in verse 11. He came to his own and his own people did not receive him. Now, it's not all bad news, though, is it? Because some people did receive him, verse 12. And those who did receive him who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God who were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So what does this tell us about how to become children of God? Better still, what is this saying to us about where you cannot place your trust? What, what is this? Well, let, 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 me, let me look at it in this way. First, it says those who received Jesus and became children of God, they were born not of blood. That's to say your relatives cannot make you a child of God. You might have parents or might have had parents who were strong believers in the Lord Jesus Christ and, and brought you up understanding and knowing him. But being born to those parents does not make you a child of God. It cannot make you a child of God. That's what John is saying. You cannot become a child of God simply by being born into the right family. That's not how it happens. Your parents might be able to point you to Jesus, show who he is. And what he's done, but being born to that family, who are both believers, cannot make you a child of God. But we also see that you that the uh, children of God are born not of the will of the flesh. The good desires of your parents cannot save you, nor could being in, being in the right community save you. There is nothing uh, about. Being in church that can save you. I and the elders can meet with you weekly, daily and teach you and exhort you with all the power of our knowledge. And yet we cannot guarantee your salvation. We cannot save you. You can come to church week by week and hear about Jesus. But at the end of the day, coming along to church cannot save you. You can read the word daily and study it. You can pray often and still that cannot save you. These are all good things. They might lead to your salvation. They're great. Do them. But of themselves, they cannot save you. And third, we are told that those who receive children, uh, who received Jesus and became children of God were born not of the will of man. I wonder if anyone's heard of the name Jeff Bezos. Do you know that name? He started a company in a rented garage selling books over the internet. He now owns Amazon, uh, which I'm sure many of us have heard about. One of the most uh, well-respected and top-earning companies in the world. He had a drive and a passion to make his business a success. He worked hard. He had sheer determination. That kind of attitude is not going to help you with salvation. Determined to be saved cannot help you with salvation. A desire to be saved is a good thing. And hopefully that leads you to understand how salvation comes. But a desire itself and will power cannot save you. Now what we need is the light of the word who became flesh. We need to trust in who Jesus is, that he is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by his death and resurrection, he has won new life with God as our Father. Well, how does that happen? Verse 13, we read that those who received Jesus were born of God. They were born of God. That is the new birth. The new birth that is by the Holy Spirit. John's going to uh, guide us in greater detail when he meets with uh, Nicodemus in chapter 3. 
But the point is raised here that the only way to receive Jesus, to trust him and know with certainty who he is and what he's done, is if God has chosen us, if God has given us faith to trust in Jesus. We must be born of God. It cannot come by our willpower, by our church family. It cannot come by our natural family. It comes from God. Just as with our natural birth, we cannot and did not have a say in it, so too with the new birth. We've been chosen by God first, and he gives us eyes to see who Jesus is. That is how we are born again. That is how we are saved. That is the only way to become children of God. We must be born of God. And all of this is by the grace of God, as all things always have been. It's a gift to the world, a world in rebellion against God, that God sent his son into the world. It was a gift to John and the other disciples that they were able to see who Jesus was, a man in whom the glory of God was on display, in whom the grace of God was on display, and through whom the truth of God was seen and known. That's what John says, doesn't he? We beheld His glory, the glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Verse 14. And grace is just that. It is a gift given to someone. And in this case, people who don't deserve it. Jesus came to the world as God's grace to us to make God known to us. That through him, we might have our relationship with God restored. Our life with God secured for all eternity. Eternity. So then do we ask the question, well, was God's grace not in the world before Jesus came? Is that what John's saying? No, he's not. There was grace through the law of Moses. Uh, John even says the law was given through Moses. It was a gift. The law was a gift. It was the way by which God had shown his people how they should relate to him, how they should relate to each other. It was gracious because within the law of Moses, there was a way to atone for messing it up. The sacrificial system was a gift of grace. To call people to himself and of all the nations in the earth, he chose one to be his people. That was grace. But the grace of God that comes to us through Jesus Christ is even greater. For while God had a tabernacle, a physical tent in the midst of his people in the days of Moses, signifying his presence among them, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, came and lived among his people as a man. The word became flesh and dwelt among us, tabernacled among us. Jesus is the very image of the tabernacle of God with his people in the midst of his people. That's who Jesus was. And as he came and dwelt among us, he showed us the glory of God in his words, his actions, and most clearly in his resurrection. Jesus showed us that he was more than just another man. This was God in the flesh. The grace of God to us through Jesus is greater than the law, because the law was delivered through Moses, but in Jesus we hear the very words of the Son of God. Jesus is not an intermediary, or not just an intermediary. He is God. His words are the words of our God. John's going to explain this again when you get to chapter 12. He, Jesus says, I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me has himself given me a commandment, what to say and what to speak. What I say, therefore, I say as the Father told me. These are the words of God that come from Jesus, not his own words. Further still, the grace that comes through Jesus is greater than that through the law. For in the law, whilst we may have the words of God in Jesus, God is made known to us in a very real and personal way. Through his life, through his death, through his resurrection, we get to know God's love for his people. We get to know God's truth. We get to know God's mercy. We get to know God's justice. We get to know God's holiness. We get to know, above all other things, God's grace. In verse 16, John says, For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. And what I think John is declaring here, that God's grace was known in the world before Jesus came. But in Jesus, it was greater. In Christ, we see God's grace to us in a more abundant way, in a clearer way, in a personal way. 
especially for those who know and trust in him. It is a gift to us. And if you have received this gift, it's because God's chosen you to be born again. It's because God has chosen you to trust in Jesus for the forgiveness of your sin. It's because God has chosen you to receive reconciliation. It's because God's chosen you to have eternal life with him as your father. And if you've received this gift of knowing who Jesus is, don't go looking elsewhere for guidance. Don't listen to the so-called teachers of this world, especially if they're not pointing to Jesus. Don't put your hope in politicians or political parties. Don't lay up your hope in preachers or pastors. Don't trust in your family, your culture. Don't even trust in yourself. Keep your trust firmly and only in Christ. And live your life showing that that trust is firmly and only in Jesus Christ. Trust in him, not only for eternal life, but for every day of your life. Eternal life comes only when we put our faith and trust in Jesus, which we can only do when God, by his grace and his choice, makes us his children. So we need to pay attention and follow Jesus. And only Jesus will do. I'm going to pray for us. Lord our God, we thank you and praise you for your word to us. We ask that you would help us to have Jesus as our saviour and if there is anyone here this day father who does not yet know him as such work in their hearts and minds today by your spirit call them to yourself that they too might be born again and come to know and trust in jesus as saviour and help us father to live with him as our lord and saviour as well that we would not put our hope in other things or other people but have our hope firmly and only held fast in jesus christ we ask your Spirit's help to do this, for we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's uh, sing once more from your songbooks. It's number 13, In Christ Alone. Oh.
Well, let us hear God's blessing. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God, our Saviour, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion and authority before all time and now and forever. And God's people said, Amen.